fear kills more dreams than failure ever will. This is one of my favorite quotes from the author and poet Susie Kassem. And one of the reasons is because I've not only seen this live out in my professional life, but I've also seen it live out over and over again in mine and everyone else's around me personal life through a variety of different ways. You see, fear is something we all face. Uh, it takes on a lot of different types of uh, phrases. We call it concern, worry, doubt, anxiety. There's fear of failure, fear of success, the dreaded FOMO, fear of missing out. And can anyone tell me what the number one fear is that most people have? Fear of what? Public speaking, that's right. More people are afraid of public speaking than of death. And it's no wonder that, uh, that we're so uh, afraid as a society because we're surrounded by fear, right? Fear sells, fear helps to control. And so it's used by media and news and throughout social media all the time. And so the, the irony of this is that not only are we more fearful as a society than ever before, but according to Steven Pinker, we are actually at the safest moment in human history. There's less war, less famine, more food security, less homicides than at any other point in recorded history. And so on the one hand, we are more fearful than we've ever been. And on the other, we're more safe than we've ever been. Now, I live a, a pretty high-risk life, uh, according to most people. I've done some crazy things, like I, I, I went trekking snow leopards with a friend of mine from Disney uh, through, the, uh, through outer Mongolia. And there is this point that you reach where they basically send you off on the camels and the horseback and say, by the way, no helicopters have enough fuel to reach this point. There's no jeeps or trucks that can come and get you at this point. So don't hurt yourself. And off you go. A few years ago, we packed up the kids and, and uh, crossed the Drake Passage, uh, which is one of the most treacherous parts of the ocean in the world in order to reach Antarctica, where we spent time uh, kayaking, uh, boating through uh, icebergs and spending some time with the penguins. And then just a few months ago, we summited Mount Kilimanjaro in Africa, the tallest freestanding mountain in the world. And, and, and this obsession with risk uh, isn't just been recently. Ever since I was a little kid, I, I was obsessed with, with uh, the Navy SEALs, which is a special forces unit in the US. And what I, what, what I loved about the Navy SEALs is that could, they could be put into any environment and, and thrive and, and accomplish their mission. Uh, I remember reading about uh, how they would be dropped out of a plane, um, skydive you know, up until the last second, deploy their chute, you know, fall into the ocean, scuba dive for 200 yards, and then reach land and accomplish their mission. And this idea of being able to be in any situation fascinated me. And so as time went on, over and over and throughout my life, I started pushing myself to do more and more of these things. I got my open water dive certificate. I have over 100 dives under me. And one of, the, uh, one of my favorite dives was when we were surprised by some bull sharks that started circling. We, we had to call that dive off uh, and head back up to the surface. I, I love spending time in the backcountry, doing backcountry snowboarding, hiking. Um, and then recently, a few years ago, I got my pilot's license. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. One of, one of the, my favorite parts about getting my pilot's license, though, was being able to recreate uh, a scene from my favorite movie as a kid, Top Gun. This is uh, with a friend of mine. I happened to be on the motorcycle, and my friend was flying my plane, and uh, we were able to get this shot uh, recreating that famous scene. So why am I so obsessed with fear and taking risks, both personally and professionally? Why is this something that I push myself and continue to do? Well, the reality was, and is, as a little child, I was terrified. I was paralyzed with fear. Fear controlled almost every part of my life. In fact, I was so scared that, that as a kid, I remember being sent off to my room to go to bed while my parents were still up watching TV. And I would, I would often hide behind the couch, or, or I would hide in the hallway with the light on. Or I remember begging and pleading with my siblings to, to let me sleep in the corner of their room on the floor, just so I didn't have to be alone. Uh, one of the most vivid memories, though, of when I started to break through this was sitting outside of a blockbuster video. Now, most of you in this room have no idea what this is. And that's OK, because before Netflix and before streaming, this is how we would go get a DVD or a video to rent. And I remember, um, I love this. You know, my, my mom would pack us up in the car, and we'd head out and, and drive down to the local Blockbuster, and we all go in, and we all get to pick out one. 
But there's one month of the year that I, I hated going to Blockbuster, and that was October, because that's when all the new marketing would come out for all the horror movies. And so, and so to greet me in the door would be a cardboard cutout of Jason from Friday the 13th, or Freddy Krueger from Nightmare on Elm Street. And I knew that I would have nightmares for months after seeing that. And so the, on this one time, I, I knew it was that time of year, my mom uh, packed us up, we went there, we got, uh, they all got out, and I stayed in the car. And I said, I'm just going to stay here. And my mom said, no, you're too young. You better be in there in five minutes or you're going to be in trouble. And so they all, off they went. And I remember sitting in the car, not sure what to do because I, I didn't want to uh, be, be in that environment. And so I just remember breaking it down into steps. Okay, step one, just Lane, open the door. Just open the door. Okay, put your feet on the, uh, on the, on the asphalt and just walk across 10 steps, get in the front door, make a right-hand turn, keep your head down, go to the uh, kids and family section over here. There's not going to be any scary posters over there. And, and just get in there, wait for your family, and, and the rest will be fine. And so that's exactly what I did, step by step by step. And I made it in and out of there just fine. So I got to ask you a question now. What's, what are some fears that are holding you back? What are some things that, that, that are uh, taking away parts of your life and opportunities? Could be a fear of rejection, uncertainty, a fear of loneliness, a fear of failure, a fear of being judged, or a fear of getting hurt. You know, as I said in that Blockbuster video uh, parking lot, I began to break down what, what the steps I needed to take. I acknowledged what my fear was, I broke it down, and I took the first step. There's an old saying, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Now, I'm not encouraging anyone to eat elephants. They're beautiful, endangered species. Please don't do that. But I will say... Uh, that phrase comes because oftentimes it's easy to look at some large thing, some big immovable object, and think it's impossible. And so the phrase is, you know, just break it down. Do it one bite at a time. And, and there's a phrase around fear that I don't like, the, the word overcome. You know, we're supposed to overcome our fears. We're supposed to get around our fears. We're supposed to figure out how to, get, how to, how to you know, ignore them somehow. And when we do that, we leave them a large immovable object, something we're trying to get around. And so that's why I try to say, I like to try and break it down and actually step through the fear. Do we take risks because we're fearless? No. We become more fearless by taking risks. So going back again to me as a child, the reason why I do all this stuff now is because I know that that child is still inside of me somewhere. And that I learned that if I, if I, if I continued to take risks, I would, I would be able to, to manage and control that better. See, because courage is a muscle. Courage is something we have to exercise regularly if, if we don't want the fear to control our lives. And, and so I learned over and over again that I need to keep that muscle strong. If I let it atrophy, that fear could go back to uh, controlling me again. Because being fearless is not the same as eliminating fear. Being fearless means knowing how to leverage fear. And the first step to leveraging fear is identifying what scares you. See, one of the things uh, about fear is that there does come a point where that adrenaline surge happens, and scientists say you actually gain more focus, more clarity than ever before. That fight or flight kind of instinct kicks in. A few years ago, I, I got my jet rating, and one of the things you learn about is how a jet engine works. So this is actually a cutout of a jet engine. Most of us will only ever see the big fan blades and the pointy part at the front there. But I love this, this, this visual, and I'm frankly fascinated with these, the mechanics of this. But basically what happens is wind enters into these turbines, and then it continues to get compressed, 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 until it reaches a point where there's a spark. And flame and, and, uh, and heat ignite and fuel mix to ignite and propel uh, this wind right out the back even faster than, than the way it came in. And that's the way a jet engine works. And when I think about this as it relates to fear, it's a great analogy because so often on an aircraft, wind is actually something that can slow it down. It creates drag on all the, all the other parts of the aircraft, except for at this moment where that wind is actually turned into the thrust that then powers the aircraft forward. And I want to give you a couple of ex examples of where that moment took place in my life. The first is right here. 
This, is, this photo was taken by my flight instructor the very first time that he got out of the aircraft and said, okay, it's time to solo, you're gonna do this by yourself. And all I had to do was taxi down the runway, take off, fly a circuit, and land. And I'd done it by this point hundreds of times with him sitting right next to me. Now, I'd love to say that you know, I was really cool and you know, I just I went ahead and did it. But uh, if you zoom in a little bit, you'll see that I was terrified, hunched over that, those controls, trying to do everything I can to make sure that everything was perfect. Because if one thing wasn't perfect, then I'd have an out. I'd have an excuse. Right, I could just say, it's not gonna happen today. I'll, I'll try again another day. So I'm looking and looking and looking. Okay, everything's fine. All right, break it down. Take the first step. Okay, what's the first step? All right, well, I'm gonna taxi. Taxi over to the runway. I can still call it off at any point. All right, so I taxi over to the edge of the runway. And then I make the call to the tower. I'm sitting on, on the edge of the runway. Uh, Kelowna Tower, Gulf Sierra, Foxtrot, Charlie. Uh, holding short at alpha for 1-6, ready for takeoff. I'm still thinking I can call this off at any point until I get the radio message back from the tower. All right, Gulf Sierra, Foxtrot, Charlie, you're clear for takeoff 1-6 without delay. And those two words, without delay, I, I knew what they were from my training, but I'd never heard them before with the uh, instructor sitting next to me. And what it basically means is, hurry up. You don't have time to wait because there's probably a big 737 or something that's about three miles back that's getting it ready, ready to land on that same runway. And so at that moment, that was it. That was the spark. That was the, the, the ignition of that fuel that then allowed me to focus. That adrenaline went, boom, power on, turn onto the runway, power to full, airspeed's alive. Hit, hit the uh, right airspeed, boom, pull back on the yoke, rotate, and we're off. And I gotta tell you, from that point on, I flew one of the best circuits I've ever flown and I landed that plane probably better than I ever had with the instructor sitting next to me. And that's because all that fear, all that anxiety became thrust, became focus because I just started to take the steps to go through it. Fast forward a few years and now I'm doing new kind of training. This is actually video of one of my first aerobatics lessons, uh, learning how to not just take off and fly around the runway but actually start doing some fun things in an airplane. And this is where I really get to pretend like I'm Tom Cruise from Top Gun. <laughs> and, it's, and it's been awesome. I'm gonna share one, per, one per, uh, professional story now on this topic. This is a photo of the exact bank that I sat outside of, just like that blockbuster when I was a little kid. And I sat in my car and I knew I was ready to go in and take a loan out on my house in order to start this crazy business idea that we were kicking around for kids and penguins, and we thought, this is nuts. All my friends had told me it was nuts. And I'm sitting there in that parking lot going, you know what, I can start up the car and drive home today, and no one is gonna fault me for that. No one's gonna have an issue with that. But I knew deep down inside that this is such a fun idea, this is such a cool idea, and I just had to do it. But it was my first home, I had a two-year-old at home, and I knew that if this failed, we could lose our house. So I sat there, I took the first step, I opened the car door, I put both feet down on the asphalt, I took 10 steps inside the door, I made a right hand turn, and I walked into that loan officer's office, and I signed the paperwork. Took out $60,000, basically every bit of equity we had in the house. And I took that into the office on Monday, and we started this kid's site called Club Penguin, but, um, and it ended up becoming uh, pretty successful and, and a few years later we ended up selling to uh, Disney. And if I wouldn't have opened that car door, if I wouldn't have put those feet down on the ground, if I wouldn't have taken those 10 steps inside, then life would have been very, very different for me. And I guarantee you I wouldn't have been standing here, that's for sure. I would have been sitting outside of a bank somewhere still. Being brave isn't about becoming fearless. It's about taking action even though you're scared. Action cures fear. So I'm just gonna close with a challenge. The challenge is this. Just think about this for a second and ask yourself this question. What is one fear that's been holding me back? One thing that you know if you can push to the other side that it's gonna be the right thing to do. But just ask yourself, what's one fear that's been holding you back? Second, what's just one small step you can take to get through that fear. One small step. What's the equivalent of you opening up that car door or you putting your feet down on that pavement? Just think about that for a second. And now the most important question of all. 
When am I going to take that step? Promise yourself. When am I going to take that? When am I going to write that email? When am I going to send that text? When am I going to make that phone call? Whatever it is, promise yourself. Maybe it's during lunch today. Maybe it's, maybe it's uh, when you get back home today. Whenever that is, take that first step. And then take the second. And then take the third. And I promise you, you'll get through it. In the immortal words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., you don't have to see the whole staircase. Just take the first step. Thank you.